This program has been made possible through a matching grant from Indiana Humanities in cooperation with the National Endowment for the Humanities. Any views, findings, conclusions, or recommendations expressed in this program do not necessarily reflect those of the NEH. It is not generally known that in the North there are thousands of acres of land to which no individual white man has ever held title and whose only title under the government of the United States has been in the name of Negroes. Yet, this is a fact, and a large part of this land exists in Indiana. American Revolution was over and our new nation had begun. In the Upper South, cotton plantations were thriving, with slaves tilling the land. But there were also many blacks in the region who were free, including a group of related families in Northampton County, North Carolina. With names like Roberts, Newsom, Sweat, and Winburn, they owned their land for generations. They were self-reliant, enjoying freedoms and liberties denied to slaves. They were able to control their own destiny. They had better relations with surrounding whites as landowners. They worshiped with an interracial congregations of Methodists. They educated their children. These families were of mixed African, Native American, and European descent. Many of the men had served with the Continental Army in the Revolutionary War. And the muster rolls that we have that still exist, um, they show the names Roberts, Walden, and Winburn. As plantations grew larger, after 1790, their security and freedom were endangered. Slave uprising struck fear in the hearts of Carolina whites. The bloody 1831 Nat Turner Rebellion occurred 50 miles from Northampton, and free blacks, now viewed with greater suspicion, came under legal attack. It was the free black community that would get the burden of tightened laws and, and, and things of that nature to make sure that their movement uh, was restricted, ownership of, of land, right to the franchise, if they had any right at all. Within the Roberts, the largest family, the new dynamic of racial tensions in North Carolina was captured in an 1828 letter between cousins Willis and James Roberts, who together had moved away. When Willis thought of returning to Northampton, James responded in anger. It seems very plain to me that you are now going to make one of the worst mistakes you've ever made in many ways. The first is that you are taking your children to an old country that is worn out and to slave on, where they are in between two fires as I may call them. For it is well known to me that where there is slavery, it is not a place for us to live. What he meant by that was that the tension that was growing between blacks and slaves and whites uh, was increasing to the point where uh, the fears in whites were, were escalating and that slaves, whether unintentionally, uh, were creating a dynamic with whites that was spilling over in a way that was beginning to jeopardize the rights and the freedoms and the privileges that free blacks had long held. So they were captured, they were caught in between two fires, between whites on the one hand and slaves on the other. By 1830, it had become time to escape the inferno. But how? Where would they go? I stop some days and think, how in the world did they make it from North Carolina and Virginia and came on wagons, walking? you know, side the wagon, you know, take turns probably. You can't get everybody in the, that wagon, that'd be a lot. And those steep hills that they have. So to think about that history, you shouldn't let it die. Free blacks like James Roberts grew determined to leave North Carolina. They found inspiration among their more humble white neighbors. The Roberts family had lived close uh, to Quaker families, and Quakers nearby had once owned slaves, but had begun to free them over the course of the early 1800s. So in thinking about the frontier, 
and choosing a place to move to from Northampton County, the Robertses had a keen interest in the fact that local Quakers were also moving to the Northwest. And in planning their own trips to the Northwest, uh, the Robertses uh, chose to migrate to locations very close to where Quakers had settled. By 1830, a general exodus gained momentum. The Roberts and others gathered their belongings and set out in ox-driven carts and wagons. From Northampton, they weathered the rugged Appalachian Mountains, then continued farther west. Several early families settled at Beach, an emerging black farm community in Rush County, Indiana. In July 1835, three of the pioneers, Elijah Roberts, Hansel Roberts and Makaja Walden ventured to northern Hamilton County, close to where Quakers and other accepting whites had settled. After carefully surveying the thickly wooded area, they agreed upon sites and made their land claims. Hansel purchased 240 acres, Makaja acquired 120 acres, and Elijah bought 80 acres. There was abundant land in central Indiana, in Hamilton County, in the 1820s and 30s. It was very fertile and it was very cheap. Three months later, their families joined them in the wilderness. Other kin quickly streamed in. By 1840, 10 African-American farm families collectively owned 900 acres. The neighborhood became known as Roberts Settlement. Despite its promising start, Prosperity for Robert Settlement came slowly. A national run on banks in 1837 brought a severe recession that slowed progress. Living standards remained primitive and the neighborhood thinly settled and isolated. This is a period when Indiana was starting to build canals and internal improvements and all that stopped because of this Great Depression. It became much more difficult to sell corn and pork and other agricultural goods off the farm to make a living by earning cash for the sale of crops. Racial hatred at the frontier was also troubling. African-American pioneers were often targets of whites' unscrupulous actions, rage and disdain. Even free black men and women knew the possibility of being taken into slavery by slave catchers and by other mechanisms and means, fair and unfair, of returning, even when they crossed the Ohio River to freedom, of being returned to slavery. When abolitionist Frederick Douglass tried to speak in nearby Pendleton in 1841, he was beaten so viciously by a mob that he lost consciousness. Ten years later, Article 13 of Indiana's new constitution forbade further black migration into the state sending an ominous message to current and prospective Roberts residents alike. <laughs> Doubts about Roberts Settlement's future faded over time. The nearby arrival of the Madison, Indianapolis, and Peru Railroad in 1854 drastically reduced the area's isolation, giving way to the community's golden years, a period lasting into the 1880s. Exceptional corn and hog prices provided money for farm improvements and creature comforts. Log cabins and wilderness paths gave way to framed homes and county pikes. The railroads were the most important technological innovation in 19th century Indiana. So the coming of the railroads, the Peru and Indianapolis Railroad in particular, near Roberts Settlement, made it possible for those farmers to engage in the marketplace and that made life much better. Between 1850 and 1870, several new families, like the Rices, Matthews, and Gilliams, were attracted by the neighborhood's prosperity. By 1880, Robert's settlement had expanded to include roughly 300 people on farms totaling nearly 2,000 acres. Race relations improved as well. Ties with nearby whites grew stronger when Robert's settlement's church along with those of their neighbors, joined the anti-slavery Wesleyan Methodist Church in the late 1840s. For the next 80 years, the Roberts Church shared ministers, revivals, and quarterly meeting picnics with surrounding white congregations in an interracial manner truly rare in 19th century America. 
As prosperity on the home front increased, the men of Robert Settlement heard a greater calling to the war front. They volunteered for the Indiana's 28th Regiment of U.S. Colored Troops and fought for the full rights of citizenship, justice, and equality. They marched off to war with golden buttons gleaming in the sun. They marched off to war carrying weapons. They fought. And they fought for the most part very bravely and courageously and they came back as honored veterans of the American military force that had defeated the South. The end of the Civil War brought increased acceptance of African Americans in the North through the fight for emancipation and the black soldiers' war experience. In Indiana, voting rights were extended to African American men and public funding was provided for black schools. The first time in the history of a country in which the federal government, the highest authority in the country, came down clearly on the side of black people as being deserving of something other than slavery, other than the status of property, uh, which is a huge, a tremendous recalculation of the possibilities of what the country could become. Robert's men, including many who had fought with the 28th U.S. Colored Troops, became active in local Republican politics. Eli Roberts ran for county recorder. An African-American uh, gentleman was elected city constable. So as a result, there was, there was definitely a very good feeling there. There was a lot of respect. Amazing grace. As Roberts' settlement prospered, its members shaped their community life to their own liking and with a degree of autonomy that was often unavailable to other African Americans. The settlement school and church served as both community centers and the embodiment of residents' values and highest aspirations. The Roberts Public School, held in a frame schoolhouse after 1870, earned a reputation for exacting instruction and moral rigor. Whether measured by quality of instruction, length of the school year, or attendance rates, the neighborhood school was at least on par with its surrounding counterparts. The Roberts Church also evolved over time. After the Civil War, Wesleyanism shifted much of its focus to the need for personal moral reform through opposition to drinking and other social ills. Considerable stress was also given to the need for self-control, moral improvement, respectability, and refinement, still emerging middle-class ideals that resonated well with Roberts residents. As a prominent former resident would later boast, through its church and school, the name Robert Settlement became synonymous with achievement, honesty, and upright character. The success of the Roberts family in both North Carolina and Indiana rested on land ownership and the opportunities it afforded. After 1870, that dynamic began to slip away. As older settlers uh, passed away, the land was oftentimes broken up among the, all of the heirs, treating all sons and daughters equally. So farms that had once included, say, 240 acres were broken up into uh, a half a dozen farms of 40 acres apiece. And by the late 19th century, a 40-acre farm was, was a very small amount of land, particularly compared to what it had been a generation earlier. With farming becoming a less viable way of life, by 1900, the population of Robert Settlement declined by half to 150 residents. A generation later, only six families remained. Families were faced with a dynamic that they could either remain at Robert Settlement and accept diminishing opportunities and a diminishing lifestyle or they could move to surrounding cities and other areas where they could pursue better opportunities. Younger Roberts residents did possess valuable assets, assets in the form of their educations, their work ethics, and moral values. These would serve them well as they moved into the world beyond Roberts settlement. I think my experiences in the country made me easily transition to the city life, my opinion. And all of us have carried, I think, the same ideals into our lives that they were, we were taught there in Robert Settlement. Indeed, 
Many of those raised after the Civil War went on to college and gained prominence as professionals. Several gained state or national acclaim, including Cyrus and Dolphin Roberts, ministers at many of the North's largest African Methodist Episcopal congregations. Adora Knight, a school principal in Terre Haute, Indiana. Carl Roberts, a Chicago surgeon and president of the National Medical Association. And Milton Roberts, an Iowa District Court judge. Even those who fared more modestly, often taking unskilled work in surrounding towns and cities, typically were able to own their own homes and send their children to high school. Moving to other communities served to sharpen awareness of the neighborhood's special character and did not lead to abandoning their heritage. In the 1910s, annual reunions began to be held among Roberts and Winburn descendants in nearby Noblesville. Starting in 1925, annual homecomings were held each July at the Roberts Chapel. From the very beginning, Robert settlement gatherings were structured both as informal picnic gatherings and as formal celebrations of the neighborhood, its distinguished history, and the heritage of accomplishment that it represents. Generations of the Roberts family descendants still gather together at the chapel that sits on the settlement land. It remains the center of worship, celebration, and remembrance. I remember from age three going up to the settlement. 84-year-old Maisie Glover is one of the oldest living descendants. I look at pictures that I have and uh, the pictures of uh, my great-grandfather and I see the pictures of my mother for she was 17 when they celebrated their 50th wedding anniversary. I look at all those people in that celebration and uh, I'm just so glad that I'm related to them. I'm just so very proud to be a part of Robert's settlement. Today, Robert's settlement's heritage continues to be extended as subsequent generations add to the history of accomplishment. Tia Goodloe's grandfather, Murphy White, was the son of a Robert's native he was Noblesville's only African-American city councilman. It sort of helps me connect everybody and it helps me make those family connections and it makes me aware of how, how significant, I guess, my, my, my own family history is and how significant um, the things that my own grandfather did um, within the Noblesville community and how he was able to do that because of his ancestors. On a sunny morning, standing amidst the Robert Cemetery's gravestones, the character and accomplishments of generations of Roberts residents comes easily to mind. The resourcefulness of those who nourish the family's initial freedom, the fortitude of those who journeyed across the Appalachians to preserve their liberty, the faith of those who endured the hardships of wilderness life, the courage of those who fought for racial justice in the Civil War, and the determination of those who thrived later in cities and towns. If one lingers in this sacred place, it is easy to appreciate the Robert Settlement story. It's a story about people who worked hard, persevered, and overcame adversity, and who did that not just once, but repeatedly over time. Uh, it's an American story. It's, it's the story of all of us. Robert Settlement's history and heritage resonates on other levels as well. It reflects and has been bounded by broader events and patterns within African American history. From slavery to emancipation, and from racism and proscription, to the quest for full equality. 
As the struggle for racial justice continues, theirs remains a living history. One that serves as a guidepost for future Roberts generations and for us all. You never forget where you come from. Always remember where you come from. And those that are up in, in Robert's settlement, I hope that it never, ever fades away.